Happy New Year, every single person tune in this evening. It's amazing to be back on your screens in the fabulous year of 2020. May this year bring us more prosperity, more goodness, more joy, and everything that our hearts desire. Welcome to Hall of Fame right here on City TV. My name is AJ Akwako Sapon, and I'm your host. This is the show that brings or uh, gets up close and candid with some of your favorite personalities, and today it's no exception. I promise you in the year 2020 to bring you exceptional interviews with some of your very favorite personalities. Now getting into who my personality is today, well, he's someone I'm really excited to interview because I saw a viral video at one point and I was like, wow, this guy is so impressive. Only to realize, fast forward into 2020, I get to sit down and have a conversation with him. Don't worry, I'm not going to give it away just yet, but again, thank you for being tuned in. We're going to go into this very amazing conversation over the next 60 minutes right here on the show. Welcome to to Hall of Fame. You're tuned in to Hall of Fame right here on City TV with yours truly, AJ Sapon. Now going straight into my guest for today. He's someone who uh, has been on the scene for quite a while. We particularly here in Ghana at least took notice of him when he went on to rep Ghana to the fullest on one amazing reality show. So I saw his audition tape, which ended up getting such accolades that I didn't even think was possible because, A, he impressed someone that's very hard to impress. He impressed someone who's in, well, in his particular line of what he did, it, the person doesn't even like at all. Uh, I'm talking about British Got Talent and Simon Cowell in specific, uh, specifically. Sorry. So Simon doesn't like comedians. However, this particular comedian impressed him so much, he gave him the most coveted thing on the show that is the golden buzzer which pretty much zips you right through to the live shows this man was wearing Ghanaian on the show like the first audition i saw he wore some a show with the dean cross symbols like the man is repping through and through and now he went on to become one of the finalists for british gone talent and is set to do incredible things in the world of comedy ladies and gentlemen it brings me great pleasure to have on the show amazing comedian Ghanaian and uh all around i think really nice guy the man, one and only Kojo Enim. Hi, Kojo. Hello, Angel. It's nice to hey, have you on the show. What an intro. <laughs> I have to look around and think about someone else. Maybe like, this amazing somebody. Like, no, it's really ha great to you. have you here. Because I, I watched that. I was like, okay. I watched your progression on the show. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's actually pretty impressive. Right. Um, but before we go into live on British Got Talent mm. and how that changed your life, let's start it all the way in the beginning. Yeah. You as a Ghanaian born in the UK. Yeah. Tell me about that. How was growing up like for you? Um, good. I actually was born in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then I came to Ghana when I was about seven. Okay. So I went to Achimota um, School. Right. Um, which was a very big culture shock for me. How was that? Um, at the time, it was quite tough because okay. I wasn't familiar with being in Ghana, etc., and um, I grew up in foster care as well. So, so I, I wasn't with my mum and my dad um, oh. um, initially, maybe from like five. So the, the, the opportunity came to go back to my parents and then we moved to Ghana, which I thought was a holiday, actually. <laughs> that's, that's how it was sold so to me. You came in and then they never took you back? No, no. My aunt, the, the, the woman that raised me, my aunt, she came with us, settled us in, and then she went back. And I was like, hey, hold on. What's, what's, <laughs> That's not meant to happen. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a tough time. Me and my sister, Anita, it was just us two at the time. And um, we moved here. Um, and then, yeah, it was, you, you get used to it, especially with children. They, mm. they absorb um, things quickly. Um, you, you know, you, you do miss home, but you get used to it. You're around your cousins, you're around your grandma, you're around your family. So, you, you know, you're having a good time. And then, like, we stayed for two years and then... Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was, I think it was just like, we was finding it still a little bit difficult. Mm. And my mum was like, you know, maybe it's best for them to go back to England. So then I've been back in England since I was about nine, I think. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, that's really, realistically, that's all I know. But being the age that I'm at now, it's like those two years were very, very pivotal because it really made me know who I was mm. kind of thing. And I think um, that's something that a lot of people may not have sometimes because they don't get to go back to you know their parents country yeah um, and i think um, i encourage more people to do that with their children because it's, it gives them the identity so then they can take that around the world and yeah. be confident in who they are so now uh as someone who's experienced ghana for two years and got went back to the uk how was it like being well now properly indoctrinated as a Ghanaian in living in the uk um it was it was it was, it was i think it was better 
because mm. I've, I've, I was more all-rounded kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes having less than and being as creative as you can, when you get the opportunity to, to have more around you, you still appreciate you, you appreciate what more is. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, also difficult moving back into the UK. Okay. Because, again, I'd, I'd become... Because I, like, I couldn't even speak <laughs> English. That is... No. Listen, my whole world's crazy because... <laughs> I remember my mum was so mad because I'd been in Ghana for two years, so it was all tree. I couldn't speak nothing else, no English. And my mum was like, we're sending you back. I go back to England, now my, my tree is small. So, so it's like, it's just been topsy-turvy. I'm going to end up speaking Chinese. I think, I think that's what's going to happen. But, um, but yeah, but it was good. It was good. And I think um, moving back into England, you just get back to the terrible weather. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and the vibes, but... Uh, yeah, man, I think, I think I was ashamed of my name before, I remember. And I was like, no one else has the Kojo. Yeah. But then when I went back to England, I was like, no, that's my name. Yeah, I know okay, who I am. I know what okay, it means. Okay. And all these things. So it's, it's teaching moments. All right. Now, uh, I gather that you're not just a comedian. You're all around creative, a mm. screenwriter, actor. You've done uh, a bit of production as well and radio and all of that. Now, how did your journey to being a creative or all around creative start? Um, did it start with comedy? Uh, it did start with comedy. I was um, actually in, where was I? It was 1998. Okay. 98. I was, I was 18 years old. And then there was a, um, a program that in America where you get to uh, work with young people. Okay. So I, I, I kind of really was interested in football. I wanted to be a footballer. But my backup plan was um, working with young people, sort of teaching. Um, and then I got opportunity. I was at a youth club in London, and then um, I progressed into a youth leader. And then there was a course that allowed us to go to Washington DC. Nice. Um, so we, we did that, and then I'm, I learned about summer camps in America, where you get to spend like three months. And it was sort of my first bit of in real independence, where I wasn't at home. <laughs> I don't have to wash dishes. You know, there's no bedtime. All that stuff. So um, so being there and looking after American kids was great for me because I'd been doing youth work in England get to do it now in America but I also got to travel mm. the country as well and kind of see it and then literally one weekend I was uh, at a, a, a like a computer store like we get like DVDs and sorry let me be honest it was video and cassette tape <laughs> yeah VHS <laughs> back in the day let's not lie now <laughs> right now you're trying to calculate how old I am <laughs> so um, I bought it um, it was Martin Lawrence <clears throat> Martin Lawrence was um, doing a stand up and things so I bought it and I was a massive fan seeing him in movies like House Party and other yeah. things. So I was like, this is amazing. Like this is I didn't even know what it was called. Didn't know it was called stand-up comedy, didn't know nothing. I just said, This guy's funny. And then halfway through watching, I started seeing myself on stage and I was like, I know I can do this. Okay. I'm sure I can do this. And then um, I came back to England and then um did a workshop which <clears throat> kind of guides you into comedy, gives you like what the business is about, a lot of self-awareness, you know, what's the first thing people notice about you when you step out. And then I started writing these little stories about my family. Um, okay. They were like the first jokes that I was writing about my family and, you know, what my household was like, etc. And then I started performing and then it kind of went there. And I think comedy allowed me to really find my confidence as well. Mm. And because at that time, being a footballer, I was quite good, but I was playing with the older kids. And then I thought there was like a bit of bullying going on. So mm-hmm. I lost my confidence in that, oh. wasn't enjoying it. But comedy was the only thing that I knew no one could ever really kind of like knocked my confidence but like I knew I was funny I knew I could be sharp okay um so yeah so comedy was the first thing really that that was um that gave me entertainment now how did your support system react when you said okay hey I think I'm pretty good at comedy like I might want <coughs> to take a chance in this part well because my mum and dad were still in Ghana <laughs> so that was pretty there, yeah, yeah 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 there's no quick yeah there's no there's no quick what are attack. you doing yeah <laughs> <laughs> they got they got they got to delay their anger, you know. Um, but um, I think my parents have always. I mean, my aunt who raised me, Sandra, she was very encouraging. Like when we was young, we went camping, we did scouts, we did. Uh, we knew the world was a big place, you know. I was at the boys' club as well, so you know, weekends you're playing football, you go and play hockey, tennis. We did so many different things, um, just to know that we can try as many, many things as possible. Wherever I was, I was always making people laugh. So if I, even if family members would come over, okay. I was always entertaining everybody. I always wanted to be in the thick of the attention. And then, um, and then yeah, and then I told my mum um, what I was doing, and she just was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Tell me another joke, because this is not funny at the moment. Um, and then, yeah, but I think 
she wasn't happy. My dad was always kind of like, do what you want to do. He's okay. kind of chilled that laid back. My mum wasn't really happy, but when she came t- to London to see me perform, then she's like, oh, my son, <laughs> my son. I was like, mum, you nearly brought the cane out just in case I was rubbish. She goes, no, it's my son. So she turned into the queen. Um, and then from then she saw it. And I think a lot of African parents, you know, they they bring some of their own fear into their children. Yeah. And then they say, look, this is what's going to make you safe. This is what's going to guarantee you security. Okay, yeah. But then I think all African parents, when they see their children proving what, they're, what they want to do works, mm-hmm. th- there's no support like an African parent. And I think sure. um, that's, that's what African parents are. They're cautious, but prove them to them that you, you know, you, what you're doing is for real and then they'll support you. No, I like that. Uh, now, 20 years doing comedy. Describe your entry then as a young comedian trying to break into the British comedy yeah. scene. Um, so I kind of came post um, an era where black comedy was thriving okay. and it was all over the television. You know, that's when you had like four channels. Like, you know, so <laughs> if you was on television, it was a big <laughs> thing. Um, um, and we had shows like Real McCoy, Desmond's as well. Were, were sitcoms that we grew up with the family watching. And so I came kind of after that. So it was kind of tough because there wasn't that much black comedy on, mm. on UK television. And then you had to start going to the comedy clubs. If you was on those shows, you get bookings everywhere. So we wasn't on the shows. And I remember um, I got opportunity to do a television show with um, another guy named called Reggie Yates. Mm. And we had a TV show together and we went to New York and we saw how amazing black comedy was in the comedy clubs. And it was just constant, like every time. And I was like, we need this back in the UK. So I came and started Kojo's Comedy Funhouse, which ran for seven years. I booked people like Kevin Hart in 2004, uh, Bill Bellamy, um, anybody who I saw in Deaf Comedy Jam, I was flying them over. Me, I didn't even know how to get them a hotel. I didn't even know about hotel, none of that. I said, I have airplane money and you can stay at my house. And that's how I met Kevin Hart. So we, I've known Kevin since 2004, like when he was coming up. Yes. Um, and then the comedy clubs kept going. Kevin goes back, tells everybody, yo, you've got to come to London. So then you end up meeting people like Dave Chappelle, um, Chris Rock. Wow. And then they all come into the club performing and then you start to build these relationships. So now when they come to England, like I'm the first person they call. If they're touring, they say, let's go. And for me, at the time, I was just young, hungry, excited, wanting to kind of impress them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was always of service as well, because I've always believed in being, being of service to others. And then when your time comes, you will, um, you'll be blessed. So. Did you ever consider moving to the U.S. where there was a large, thriving black comedy scene? I did move to the U.S. In 19, no, 2009, when Obama... I just become president. I, I was all part of the hype. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. we can. When Obama was president, I thought everything was going to be free. I thought black people would not have to use cash again. Like, I thought, yes, we just end that store. Yes, and we just can. Start We've taking done everything. This. Yes, pull, pull, your, pull your basket. Um, so I was there and I was like, no. And then I remember that was when recession hit as well. Yes. So my, my small pounds was just, it wasn't worth nothing, man. So I went there um, because I got to a stage in the UK where I just wanted to kind of just be around people who mm. were doing better, learn more. Um, and I did that. You know, the comedy scene in New York is the mecca of comedy. It's like every single night wow. you can just work, 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 work. So, so it was good to kind of be around those people as well. Um, and again, I get hungry comedians, you know. And then I also moved to LA as well wow. for like a year. Again, <clears throat> just to tap into film and why America's films are so great and what is it about it. And just uh, being a student, you know, like I, I really love what I do and, and the business and the, the, the thought behind it um, of being a creative. And um, just to having a taste of what these places offer and then bring, bringing it back home. So, yeah, yeah so comedy has kind of just been like the door to other things. And now let's talk about other things. Uh, tell me about your development in the creative scene, doing other things, uh, screenwrite, all of that. How did that begin for you and what did you accomplish in those particular fields? Good question. So I, when I was in New York, I, I felt like I was living in 10 years ahead of the UK, maybe even more. Okay. So when I came back to the UK, it was kind of hard to kind of have less when I know the mindset that I have and what I've been exposed to. So what I always did was I've never been someone to complain about what we didn't have in the UK. Okay. If I saw something, I would try and get as close to it back home. So when I saw when I went to New York, we did the comedy club for seven years. Um, 
I grew up watching Wild and Out with Nick Cannon. Yeah. So then MTV approached me about doing a comedy show. I was like, let's do something similar. Yes. You know, like, let's do something similar. Stop watching America. <laughs> like, let's, let's create something similar. I grew up watching House Party Friday. Uh, what else was there? Um, all these American f- comedy films. So then I was like, we need one in the UK. So I wrote a movie called The Weekend, which um, was on Netflix as well. And all of these things have come from being inspired. Wow. You know, sometimes you can sit here and go, oh, everything's in America. Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? But what are you doing to in create Korea. those things? Um, of, of late, um, I watch a lot of programs like BET and then you've got like Black Girl Magic, etc. So I was like, there's black women in the UK that never get told thank you. That never get, you know, a pat on the back. That, yeah. that never get, you know, like we appreciate you. So we created an award show, me and uh, my business partner, Nika, called the Black Magic Awards, wow. where we just celebrate people. It's just every year we pick 10 women and we say thank you. And everyone comes out and it got so big that we started doing the men's and then this year is going to be the first year we're doing both together. Wow. And everyone comes out from Idris Elba to Amal Amin to John Boyega. Like everybody comes out to celebrate each other because I think we, we spend most of our year being in competition. Yeah. When sometimes you can just look at your sister and brother and be like, you know what, man, because of you, I'm doing what I'm doing, you know? So it's about bringing that, that community together showing them that we can mm. achieve if we do it all together kind of thing so what are some of the difficulties in trying to implement these things in the uk because i'm sure there must have been some pushback yeah black with, people yeah really <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we can we want to help each other but sometimes we're, uh, we're standing in our own way you know what i'm saying yes. like, sometimes we're standing in our own way i think um with us, because um, that, that's what I'm passionate about. I'm really passionate about black people really? and, um, yeah. and and us knowing that we can do more and <clears throat> kind of breaking it. I think being competitive is good, but I think being competitive against yourself is even better. You know, when you know you've achieved something, can you go again? Can mm-hmm. you beat what you've already done yeah. and continue to excel? Um, rather than me being better than someone else kind of thing, you know? Um, because this crabs in a barrel mentality took 400 years to create so it'll take 400 years to get rid of but we've got to start it and i think um what i try to do for us sometimes hasn't always worked um sometimes people don't see the vision you know and you're like let's do a movie together we ain't got no money to pay nobody <laughs> and and, and then people are like oh i don't want to do it but i'm like well you're not doing you say you want to act you're not, doing you're, anything, you're not doing anything anyway. But they want to get paid for it. Right. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, let's just use this all as experience because there will be a bigger opportunity that, that presents itself. So you have, you have those kind of um, struggles sometimes, um, um, helping people. Um, but at the same time, it's not, you know, it's not about the quick solution. It's about the bigger, the bigger picture. And sometimes mm-hmm. you've got to be consistent in your, your efforts so that people know, you know what, this guy's for real. He's not just trying to waste my time or, True. you know, so you just got to keep going and then people will um, join the journey, really. I like that. Well, I'm having a conversation, an amazing conversation with comedian Kojo Aneem. We'll be right back after this. Don't go anywhere. This is Hall of Fame. You're tuned in to Hall of Fame right here on City TV. My name is AJ Akwako Sup. I'm having an amazing conversation with ace comedian Kojo Inim of, uh, well, I think renowned, at least here in Ghana, for Brains Got Talent. Uh, been doing amazing things over the last 20 years. And I'm having a conversation with him about all the amazing things he has accomplished, not only in the British creative industry, but as well across the the world now coming into radio mm. at some point uh you were, you were big on radio tell yeah. me about that so i was um on choice fm yeah which was kind of like the number the, the one the thing the, yeah. the black music scene thing it was yeah the black radio station. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was i grew up listening to it it would get me to school smiling laughing <laughs> and then um because comedy was going well i was young enthusiastic, um, making a name for myself, they um, approached me to take over a breakfast show that had been going for like 25 years. Wow. Um, and um, I was like, whoa, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but I knew that the audience were familiar with me from coming to my shows. Um, I always asked other people that I knew was on the stage, like, why is no one ever, why is no one taking the breakfast show? Like, you know, there was, a, yeah. there was another comedian called Richard Blackwood. He was on there and I was like, how come you not ain't taking the breakfast show? That, that's the main show. And it was like, ah, oh, it's too much, it's too much. And I was like, listen, if I'm going to go to something, I want to be great, you yeah. know, and I don't want to just be on a show that maybe people aren't listening to as much. Breakfast show is the biggest show in any radio station. Absolutely. So I took the challenge on. 
um, and was there for, there for like four years. Four years did breakfast show. And I was doing that prank phone call, so on the way to work, <laughs> calling people, winding them up, um, giving away competitions, interviews with everybody. Um, and it was just it was just good. And I think that was one of the first things that allowed me to kind of step into my own lane a little mm. bit. Um, um, and just really showing people that this is for real, this comedy thing, because you can't fake funny exactly. at 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so... Uh, so that was kind of good. And then, you know, you, you become like this trustworthy voice for people when they're getting up in the morning. And you've got to think about all the energies that are people. Some people don't want to go to work. They're tired. Some people are coming back from work in the morning. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a great time doing that. And then, um, yeah, and then I remember this is what happened. I remember I was there for like a month. And then there was a, another station across the hall a bigger station than us, and somebody got sacked on a Tuesday. <gasps> I was like, hold on, they let him come in Monday. <laughs> then let him they, go. They could have just sacked him <laughs> on the weekend. They let, they let him enter on a Monday to let this guy work for one day. What? And I was like, and this guy was a big personality, and I was like, if they did that to him, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> so from then, I already was like, listen, this game is not loyal. This radio business isn't yeah. loyal. Sometimes in radio in England, <laughs> you don't get to say bye. They just say that was your last show. Wow. Literally. Cutthroat is all stations in England. So I, that, that, re that reminded me, plan ahead. Always plan ahead while you're here. Mm -hmm. Plan your next move. So I um, did radio for like four and a half years and I, I decided to leave because the music had changed. It changed. It turned into Capital Extra. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't complain. I don't moan about the music. If it's not for me, I then I, I move on. And then um, when you move, when you say you're moving on, you can actually get to say goodbye kind yeah. of thing. So I did that, and then um, that's when I moved to L.A. and then started um, writing films. And stuff. Wow. And now <coughs> coming to Britain's Got mm. Talent. Now, you'd been doing this for 20 years. You yeah. were known across the U.K. Uh, you'd done impressive things. You'd groom a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, what led you to say, I'm going to do British Got Talent? I lost everything. Tell me about that. I lost everything. So... When I did my movie, it was one of the best and worst experiences of my life because I decided to do a movie with, with somebody who uh, did me wrong, basically, financially. So wow. we had the, the movie was on Netflix, it was on iTunes, it was all over the place, and I never made a penny. No. Didn't make a penny. And I put so much of my personal savings into making this film. And then um, it really put me in a very financial situation. I was in L.A. at the time, and I had to come back, leave L.A., I had to come back home. I was on my friend's couch for a year, so I couldn't even afford to have my own place anymore. And then, um, and it, I was just kind of just in a very desperate situation. And then I, I also met a business partner who came and sold me a, a dream. And when you're desperate, any you, small yes. thing will make you go, oh, okay, I can get back in the game like this. That was another bad decision that I made. I got extorted. So there was a lot going on and um, no one really knew that. And then... Um, I kind of got to a place where I had to fall. You know, sometimes when you're going through something, you try and delay the fall, innit? It's like you're falling down, so you want to hold on. So I need you to grab, grasping yeah, onto yeah. straws and everything. And then my mum was like, you can't get up until you fall. Stop breaking the fall, do you know what I mean? Just let it happen, know what it is, learn your lessons and move on. And I really wanted to go to court about that and all the other stuff. And then my mum was like, listen, let it go. Because even if you win, you, you don't feel, it won't feel like a win because of what you've been through. Mm. Something of the same size or even bigger will fill its place. Wow. So I prayed over it and then I was like, you know, what am I going to do to get myself back up there? Um, then I um, met my partner and then my, my son was born as well. So then now you've got added know, pressure yeah. to kind of be like, you know, you, you, now it's not about you. Me, it's I can make me, I can make yeah. five pounds last for seven days, <laughs> but not my son. Yeah. You know, I want the best for him from the get go, um, to, and I want him to be proud that I done something for him. So um, when Britain Got Talent approached me, <coughs> at first I was like, "I'm not doing this show. Are you crazy? <laughs> me on the show? Why? Who do I know like me goes on there?" Um, and then uh, my friend, my friend that said, "Listen, they don't know you. So all the things that you've done." It's only to a certain demographic. Yeah. This is an opportunity to... Be to the entire the, UK. The, the, the entire UK at first, and then you realise it's the, the Across whole, the, the world, world, yeah. So, so I was like, you get to be like a new guy with 20 years experience. 
So go and show them what they've been missing out on all for 20 time, years. Yeah. So that was the kind of motive. I went out there. Um, all I kept on thinking ultimately was, what's black people going to say, man? They're going to say, like, Kojo, why is he doing this show? <laughs> is he mad? It's too much After of a risk. After all that you've done. <laughs> yeah, too much of a risk. You've been on Wild and Out with Nick Cannon, you Kevin Harsh, bro. Why are you doing this? But I, but, but I did it because there's someone else who's in that position that may be older, that may think, you know what, maybe it's for the young kids now, maybe it's past, my time is gone, I've had my moment. But then there's always a way to reinvent yourself, you know? Mm. And um, <coughs> God, was, God gave me this avenue. I know that for a fact because it was the last thing that I'd ever do. And then we come to faith. And I think everything that I was going through, I had to really work on my faith because faith to me is no evidence, but knowing is going to be fine. Yeah. And um, I was like, God, you give me Britain's Got Talent. Please give me something else, like, that, that's so I can keep my credibility, yeah. you know? But sometimes when you want something great, you've got to make a great move and be uncomfortable. And my pastor always says the first sign of um, progress is uncomfortability. Mm. So I went on this show, I was nervous. All I was thinking about is what's everybody going to say? I wasn't even thinking about Simon Cowell. Yeah, I've done my research. <laughs> he doesn't like comedians. There's four judges. All I need is three. Just as long as I don't get the red buzzer. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm fine. <coughs> and then, um, yeah, I went to do the show. I was nervous. I remember my hands were sweating. Um, and I never really get nervous, but I was sweating. But one thing I would say is my happy place has always been, apart from my son, my happy place has always been the stage. Mm. If I'm scared or fearful of anything, my happy place is always the stage. And um, I just zoned out. Didn't look at none of the judges, forgot they were there. Wow. Gave everything to the audience. Because they're the real judges. Yeah. The judges, very, very few times will they go against the audience, you know. And I'm used to the audience. I'm not used to being judged. So I said, let me give the audience everything that I have. Yeah. And um, I went and did it. And then um, what, what actually happened on the show, Simon spoke first. Oh, so the editing. Yes. But this was day one of filming. So they have 16 days. They film. Okay. 10 in London, 6 in Manchester. This is the first day of filming. Me, I was at, I was there. They did two shows a day. I was on this first, I was in the second show, third on the second show. So I got there at 8 a.m. I was on stage at 9 in the evening. No. Yes. So me, I'm changing my jokes. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this one. No, let me, no. Nah, nah. So you had seen people come on. You had seen comedians come on. You had seen all kinds of Three acts. comedians went on before me. No. Simon was not in a good mood. And then me, I was like, me, let, just give me my small bread buzzer now. Let me go about my business. I went on stage, performed, um, and then everybody just stood up. And then I was just like, wow. Like, What's for going me, on? That was the validation that, I've, that I felt like I've been working for for 20 years. You know, that was everything to me. And then that's why I kind of like, the nerves that was in me, you couldn't believe AJ, like I was shaking. Can you imagine? And then I started just obviously... Uh, tearing up. What people don't know is that my contact jumped out of my eye. <laughs> my contact, even my contact was so excited. My contact was like, yes! So now I have one eye, right? You so can I'm only there. see from one eye. Yeah, me, I'm there. I'm just blurry. Everything is going crazy. <laughs> and then Simon spoke first. And Simon's like, you know, you obviously you heard what he said. And then when he pressed the golden buzzer, man, I was just like, wow. Wow. And then the hosts come out. They run out. They're like, Kojo, look, look. And I'm like, I can't see. I can't see. <laughs> All this stuff's going on, me. So I'm crying. One eye can see, one eye can't see. But that was God saying, this is why I told you to take this path. And that's what God does. He puts you through something that's going to challenge you. You know, you can be comfortable, but that's not progress. Yeah. He said, I'm going to put you in front of the world, but I need you to listen to me. Yeah. You know, if you really say you want this, trust and believe. And I went, Naked, genuinely, like I, 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 I went naked. I, I trusted him completely, one hundred percent. And this is sometimes we all have plans for ourselves, but what God's got planned for you is so much better. I can't imagine. Yeah. So much better, and I feel like that's been my testimony in this journey because, you know, two years ago I was on someone's couch, you know, someone's couch, and I could have easily just kept feeling sorry for myself you know, depressed and all the other stuff, but I decided that I was going to change everything when my son came, and um, that's been my biggest motivation. Now, when it aired, how, did, how was the reaction? 
I stayed in my house for four days straight. No. I stayed in my house. Me, I, I, even, I snuck out to go and get milk, I think. And as soon as I got there, ah, ah, I just, it was, and these, these, these are my, these are my neighbors. I've been living there, you know me, right? Like, you know me, like, but they, it went crazy. I was in every newspaper for the whole week. My dad wow. was in Kumasi and he's just there watching television and he's like, Hey, <laughs> call me. He said, son, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Um, and that meant everything to me, you know, yeah. because uh, for him to be all the way over here and see that was um, was really, really good. And um, and yeah, it's just, you know, you do a small show like that, you think it's just the UK. Then you look at the views, like 30 million views. Yes. And you're like, me for small me. Like, <laughs> wow. But I felt like because I've been doing it for 20 years, I was confident enough to always project Ghana, mm. project my history, project my culture. Because for 20 years, I've been told by white people, man, you've got to change your jokes. They won't get it. They won't understand. You know, like, you've got to change it up. And I'm like, no, like, I can't change. I, that means I'm this being someone stories, else. Yeah. And even the small um, Adinkra sign, that small thing meant so much to so many people. Yes. So many people. And then the semi-final, we were like, let's go, let's go. I saw that you were like proper, like, yeah. kaftan side of vibe. I was like, okay. Absolutely, Simon, let's go to church. <laughs> you know, like, like, like let's do that this. That sounds actually really funny. Let's do this because I want to <laughs> let you know that I'm a man of God. I, I, I'm Ghanaian, first and foremost. Um, and, and we're funny too. And even in the final, I was suited and booted, but I came out to Afro B. Yep, I, uh, Joanna, Joanna dancing yeah. in. Yeah. And, and, and it shows you like there's so many small minded people in this business that will hold you back. But when you know who you are, when you know who you are, you break down any door, any barrier. And that's why I felt like some people would be very scared about doing their own thing, you know. And I was just like, just let me do what I've been doing. Hmm. You know, I, I remember after the first audition, the, exit, the producer was like, we got to come up with something crazy. I said, please, leave Relax. me alone. <laughs> Is that, the same thing will happen again if you leave me alone. Yeah. And that's what they did, and they respected me a lot. Because sometimes you go on these shows and they tell you what to wear, exactly. tell you what to do, tell you what to say. Can't say this, can't say that. They knew that they couldn't do that with me. And I think Simon allowed me to do exactly what I wanted to do. And ever since, he's been really cool. Wow. Now, how did your life change after the show? Uh, I've had more stamps on my passport. <laughs> um, we got bookings from everywhere. My manager, Quincy, was like, like I brought him on board because I was like, I cannot handle this. Yeah. You know, I cannot handle Quincy took me to my first ever stand-up show when I was um, 20. My first ever show, now he's my manager. And we have a really good agent, and now we've been to Canada, Nigeria, come to Ghana, Dubai. <coughs> we're, we're going to Australia, we're going to South wow. Africa, we're doing all this other stuff. And now I've got a tour in the UK, my first UK, because that's what I wanted. My More goodness. than anything else, I just wanted to tour my own tour. And I've supported Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart, Chris Rock. These are legends in the game, you know. And um, I've worked with Russell Simmons in New York. Like, I've worked with some phenomenal people, but yeah. now... God has allowed me to step into my own lane. All the knowledge that I've learned from all these other people, I get to really implement that now. And um, I'm ready. I'm really, really yes. ready. And yeah, it's just been so many blessings. I've got my teeth done. <laughs> That's another thing. It's so nice. Like, I literally can stare at it people, all day. Like, <laughs> the company messaged me. They was like, oh, we love your performance and Prince Got Talent. We want you to come there. And then I was like, okay, me, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> all I know is my teeth will be white. <laughs> And then I went there, and then they was like, okay, open your mouth. And, and then they started, I was like, hey, what's going, <laughs> what's on? going on? Me, I'm in Turkey. I don't know nothing. You know, Turkey is the land of meat. They got meat everywhere, the food. Me, I can't eat nothing. I'm there in Turkey for, for a whole seven days. I can't eat nothing. What? Mad. So, but that was a little blessing. And then um, all these little perks started happening. I've just done a huge commercial that's out in the UK at the moment for um, um travel company. And... Um, yeah, it's just so many blessings, you know, and I feel like, you know, my, my manager says, listen, you're not being paid for what you do now. You're being paid for what you've done before. Yes. All that knowledge, all that investment that you put into Everything yourself, all the stuff that you've been through, that's what people are now paying you for. So just continue to keep being hungry, keep working, and we continue to grow. Brilliant. Now, uh, was comedy lucrative back then when you started out, when you were doing things, when you are opening for others? Was it actually paid? I did not know you could get paid from comedy. No. I didn't even know. Like, I just wanted to make people laugh. It came from a very honest place. 
Me, I'll pay. I'll keep making people laugh for free if I <laughs> if I was not getting money because I love humor. I think humor heals people. It counsels people. It lets people know that you're not the only one that tried to put washing up liquid in the, in, in the dishwasher. <laughs> Me, I thought that was a genius idea, you know. Until these bubbles blah, 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 started coming, in. I'm swimming in my house. Uh, it, it was mad. So you know, we we all do crazy things, and we we think it's only us sometimes, you know. But um, Comedy, the first time I got paid, I got £15, and I called everybody in my phone book. <laughs> everybody. I was like, I made it. I made it. Mom, I'm getting you the house. whole pounds. Yes, well, not the house, just the doorknob. <laughs> we work on the rest. But, um, but that, that's how innocent it was for me. And then, um, so, and then it became lucrative. If you start making it, I remember I went full-time comedy two years in. I said, mm. this, I know what I want to do. This is what I want to do. I'm good at it. Let me continue to just... Do the journey, you know, yeah. like actors, you know, you've got to earn your keep, you know, and you've got to go and find work. You've got to make sure that your, next, your last show provides another show. So I did that for a long time. And then, um, as I said, put on the comedy nights and started putting on some other stuff, collaborate with other people, promoters. And now it's just like crazy, completely yeah. crazy. And now, you know, in the process of buying house here. Like we, can't, we, can't, we can't wait to have you in Ghana, like, I'm permanently. Coming. I'm coming, man. Whether sun, sunny all the time, I can, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> but you also have an entertainment company, The Colour Network. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. What, so what Col- kind of things are we hoping to accomplish with that? Colour Network now is actually rebranded to the Black Magic Network. Okay. We've done the award show and then it really stuck. And I think Black Magic kind of has a negative connotation, but we wanted to, 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 to make yeah. it the beautiful thing. I hate black being a negative. You know, and I'll be wanting to make it a positive. So the Black Magic Network is basically an online um, company that's our stories, you mm. know. And, and visually, we have to... Like, where you guys are here is so much better than the UK because we, we, we get to see each other mm. all the time. Yeah. You know, I'm walking down the street, I see billboards mm. of us all the time. There's nowhere else in the world that has us all the time. So we're encouraged by what you guys are doing here and, and, and what happens in parts of America. And it's so important that we continue. Like, I have a son now. I want him to see himself yes. being great in others all the time. So we've got to be proactive in that visual that the stories we're telling is uplifting and not just we're thugs and we're gangsters and we, we treat women bad and we don't respect people. Like We're God-fearing people. So we've got to start showing that side of us to the world and create our own narrative. So that's kind of what it is. It also gives opportunities to young presenters to get them in the game. I've done presenting on every level. Yeah. So I know what it takes to get into the door. So they get real education, you know? And we do like um, seminars as well. We do um, loads of events that bring people together, networking events that, you know, you two don't know each other, but I know both of you. So let's you don't need together, to yeah. meet, you know? And and because that way you provide less excuses. So that's kind of what, we're trying to do, but just ma- mainly give an opportunity, real experience to people that can get into media. I like that. Now, what have been your observations of the Ghanaian comedy scene in general? So, um, big up to DKB. Mm-hmm. He had a show, um, the Year of Return um, comedy show, and he invited me down there, and I felt like it was so important for me to go down and meet all of the people that are making people laugh out oh, here, right. because often, our, you know, African comedians are Nigerian. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, as great as they are, I think now, hopefully, what I've done with British Got Talent encourages more young Ghanaians to kind of say, no, this is our swag and yeah. this is our vibe and this yeah. is what we do here. We're not as aggressive as the Nigerians are, yeah. but that's okay because we've got our own things that make us laugh, you know. And I think me going down there and meeting everybody, I know how much it meant to them, but what they don't know is how much it meant to me mm-hmm. to kind of see that I've inspired you guys to say, you know, I can take this further. So we are planning a whole bunch of things that allow us to kind of collaborate, work together. Hopefully we can get some of the guys out into the US, the UK, so that they get to travel as well, you know, because... And, and, and just actually getting them Nigerians, Nigeria bills as well, because these guys are funny, like yeah. MJ the Comedian, yeah. uh, Jerry, uh, Waris, he was yeah. Uncle Sam, you know, Jacinta, who yes. I love, that's my sister, <laughs> love that girl. And, yeah, you know, they're doing amazing things, and I love what DKB is doing because he's really passionate about um, Ghana 24-7. I like that. Now, as a comedian, or <coughs> as comedians, where do you draw the line between what is offensive to a person or picking on a person to a certain extent and what will just generate laughs? I think everything's funny. <laughs> okay. I'll be at a funeral going... <laughs> 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 because, because, you know... They, 
Comedy is inappropriate. Mm. It is inappropriate. And I think it's the last honest thing we have. Now you've got everybody on social media saying, oh my gosh, you see you what Kevin Hart that. said? You can't say this. Yeah. And if you watch Dave Chappelle's new special, he hit everybody in yes, the chest. Yes, basically. Because comedy is that. Ooh, I shouldn't be laughing at that. Ooh. <laughs> and we all do that, you know, and we're, because we're human first. So I think um, I draw the line when I think it's disrespectful to me. Okay. When I feel like it's not funny to me, that's my line okay. where I'm not going to um, attack, attack, you know, attack that, that topic. Or if I don't know enough about what I'm talking about, I leave it alone mm. because you don't want to offend anybody when you don't have all of the information or get the information wrong. I think our job is also to teach um, through humour. So you, people have to be careful with, with um, what they say. But everything can be funny if you deliver mm. it right. Okay. All right. I like that. Now, what are we looking forward to in 2020 here in Ghana? Are you going to be doing a few more things in Ghana? <laughs> Should we expect maybe a Kujuni comedy show here in Ghana? Maybe? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm planning definitely, first of all, to connect with the local comedians here. Mm. I think we've got to do something maybe yeah. in the summer. A big show where we can just really just get all the comedians out, let yeah, them express like themselves. And people that may come because I'm here that haven't seen these guys... It all helps, you know, um, and and it's about having even maybe a comedy club where it's not just big show. Because I know in Ghana, Africa in general, we just like the big show. But sometimes something weekly that has 200 people every week. That's true. Making people laugh. You know, we can get Americans over here. We can get UK comedians over here. Stretch it out a bit. You know, there's so much laughter that hasn't been tapped in Ghana yet that we can definitely do. So that's something I'm thinking about. Um, after my tour, um, I'm planning to do a Netflix um, show. Can't wait. <clears throat> and I, I spoke to my manager yesterday and I was like, what would you think we can do it in Ghana? Oh. What would you think that would look like? So, I don't make promises, but that's Maybe what, we'll see something like that's that. What I'm, that's what I'm going to be fighting I for like because that. I feel like I don't just want another show where you're just in a theatre anywhere mm -hmm. just telling jokes. Like, I want it to have a story. I want it to have a, a nice rhythm to it. And I think mm -hmm. everything that's happened for me with Beards of Got Talent, Africa has been the main source of support for me. Um, so I don't want to just get that and then move on to the Western world and yeah. just give them the same thing. So that's something that I want to try and recreate. You know, I remember growing up looking at Ali and George Foreman fighting in Zaire. You know, that, that moment, the build up before it, that's the kind of energy that I want. I don't want Kevin Hart to come to Ghana first and okay. everybody goes, it's amazing. Or Dave Chappelle, I think we should be doing that, you know. So um, that's the plan, hopefully. But definitely going to develop a lot of the comedians out here and give them more opportunities. I like that. Now, also with the year of return, I mean, <coughs> you, you were part of the festivities. You saw, you, you I'm, I'm sure, had a, a few conversations with some of the returnees that came through. How, as someone also in the diaspora, have you observed the year of return activities and probably its benefits for Ghana? I think um, something that I heard that really impressed me and made me look at myself is that with all the influx that came in this year, <clears throat> we have to stop the mentality that we're coming to help Ghana. Okay. Because there's a lot that we can learn from people here. The Western world teaches us that this is normality and this is, this is what we have is more, but not necessarily. And I think if you come here enough, you understand that there's so much advancement here mm. in Ghana and in Africa in general that we can learn from. You know, people always... One of the funniest things that's happened is Everybody's complained about, ah, oh, the food, it takes so long, man. <laughs> the food, it takes so long. You have to order it yesterday for it to come today. <coughs> but I said, Ghanaians aren't on time. They, they deliver in time. Mm. Yeah? Okay. We're so used to go to a Chinese restaurant in the UK. Evan. Even after you finish ordering, the food is on your, <laughs> on your table. You're like, ah, you did not cook this. You just put it in the microwave. We're, we're here. Prepared meals take time. Yeah. So when the Western world was so driven on time and being late and being on time, that here there's a relaxedness about yes. time. And I think you've got to respect that. That, you know, it might take a little bit longer, but that's somebody that's cooking your well-prepared meal. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So these are the kind of things that I'm learning that I've been here. But I think Fuse ODGs, well, like he's the godfather of my son. Oh really? Oh yes. goodness! Good, 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 good. I love that. He's my brother, okay. and I love what he's doing. And he, he had his Tina festival that was so moving. Yeah. Like just how still everybody was, and just celebrating each other. And he had Americans here, people from Europe, and it was just like so phenomenal. And we're blending in with the locals as yeah. well, which was really nice. So I thought the year of the return was a brilliant idea. 
I think, you know, although it seemed like a lot of partying and, you know, a lot of <laughs> getting on, it, there was also beautiful moments. You know, Eddie Caddy done the Pan-African Link um, thing with Luau Deng. And everybody's just coming over. And I think Ghana is the centre of Africa because this is where our tourism is is open. Yeah. You know, we are very accommodating to a lot of people. And I think it starts here. So um, hopefully it travels around. Oh, have you seen the, the other interesting ones? No, Draw we return. are not entertaining Get nonsense. Return. <laughs> we are not entertaining nonsense. There's a whole lot of going on. <laughs> ah! What is going on? What door? Yeah, they, they, it's want, ridiculous. they want to open the door. It's lazy. It's lazy. You have affirmation. Enjoy it, man. My door of return. It's mad. It's silly. But let them enjoy themselves, isn't it? We're yeah. here. We're doing our thing. We're, we are the innovators and we will continue to be. Okay. 2020 wedding bells, perhaps? Oh, uh, not sure about that. The we'll what? see. Because I've got a tour. I've got a tour. I've got okay. a tour. I've got to travel the world. I want my son as well to just travel with me and see how big the world is. Um, but we're, we're on our way. We're uh-huh. definitely on our way, so okay. we'll see. All right. Well, now we're going to go on to one of my favorite points, which is the games. Uh, he's going to pick an act, and I'm going to try and guess what he picked. But that should be interesting to see. So don't go anywhere. The game part of mm-hmm. Hall of Fame is coming right up. You're tuning into Hall of Fame right here on City TV. My name is AJ Akwako. So I'm having a conversation. And now a game segment with ace comedian Kojo Inim. Now, at this point in time, in my hands, a little bowl filled with uh, certain words, phrases, actions. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, he's going to pick one. We're going to do three. And then if he is successful, to, uh, successfully acted out, enough for me to get it, that is. Uh, he's only successful when I figure it out. But uh, if he gets it, then he wins. At the end of the season, we shall put out all the points together. The celebrity with the most points gets a special weekend getaway, courtesy us. Yeah, it's like that. So it's in your best interest to get it. So next My time you're Hollywood back. My Hollywood career. <laughs> It's now down to you, AJ. Starts now. Okay. All right, let's go. Huh. Oh, do, do, my do, do. Gosh. I'm, I'm now going to blend. I, I shouldn't be. I, don't be daft. Figure it out on the first try. Oh, okay. You ready? Okay. Foot. Football. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think I'm, 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 I'm not bad, though. <laughs> okay. Okay. Aeroplane? Yes! Yeah! Come on! Oh, oh this is easy. Okay. Come on. We do 10. We do 10. We can't do 10. Okay. We will figure it all out. They're doing the 20 seconds. Mm. You see, that no, time no, hasn't even gone once. Hollywood, are you ready? Hey, come, come on. on. All right. Okay. Okay. Boom. Piano? Come on! <laughs> come on! <laughs> Who's your champion? Let's go again. Ah, He's your champion. Come hey, on, come Kojo. On. Hey. All right. Okay. Okay. Okay, ready? Okay. Fainting. Oh, no! Oh, oh. Yo, what do I want to They're not ready for me. They are not. Okay, final one. Final one. Final, final one. Because, I mean, if you're, doing, if you're so good, but as well just keep going. <laughs> oh, I like that fainting. I'll, I'll do it again. Oh, okay. Um. Oh, this one. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Moto. Motorcycle. Oh, no! Look at God! Look at God! And he got it all. In fact, even more than even budget for now, could you hear the best? Thank no, you. If, if I ever do a charade competition, you're my partner. Like, I'm, I'm yeah, good at these like... house games. I'm good. I'm good. I'm ready. <laughs> But thank you, Kojo, for coming through. Thank you so much. This has been fun. amazing. I look forward to great things from you this year. And uh, all the goodness that you deserve is coming straight to you. Thank you. And thank you for being tuned in. Happy New Year again. It's going to be a fantastic year filled with great conversations right here on Hall of Fame. Thank you so much for being tuned in. Special thanks to Water Jewelry for my jewelry. And, of course, to you for being tuned in. Join in the conversation with the hashtag Hall of Fame. And I'll be back your way next week with another impressive edition. This has been Hall of Fame right here on City TV. And above all, you know what to do. Keep watching.